Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's 6-11. I'll be calling the June 21st, 2022 Board of Selectmen meetings to order, and we'll open with public comment. Mr. Hutchinson or Hutchins? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, super. Eric Hutchins, uh, 45 Pools Lane. Um, I just wanted to um, just briefly bring up uh, just a couple of comments about um, the priority and I guess emphasis on getting a, a new conservation agent and new Con conservation commission members in Rockport. I realize that the town administrator and, and board of selectmen are working on that. And uh, like I say, I, I wanna support you any way I can. I've, I've received a number of calls, which I always do on environmental issues for years now, uh, both from developers and people really worried about activities that have been taking place and I just, I just want to emphasize the, the level of priority, I believe, that making sure that we have an effective and, and uh, functioning commission and staff as soon as possible for, for just a variety of purposes. So that's really it. I just really wanted to emphasize that. And thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, would it be helpful if uh, Selectman Donnelly and I gave the quick update on that now? Yeah, if you want to waiting. give a quick update. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, Denise, do you want to start with uh, what you've been doing with the agent position? Sure. So I've conducted two interviews, um, reviewed a number of resumes. Um, I think we have um, some strong candidates in the pipeline. And these are both people who are moving ahead in the interview process and um, have agreed to come up and um, interview and meet with Mitch. And I will be taking them around town to give them a sense of, um, you know, some of the areas that they're probably going to be paying attention to should they come on board, but we're, we're making good progress in that process. And on the uh, commission front, uh, we were able to book um, some time with town council, the special specialist who handles um, our conservation and land use uh, and real estate matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, next group of potential candidates uh, for membership on the commission um, uh, having a conversation with her on roles and responsibilities later this week. Um, so that will hopefully, uh, get us to a point where in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to move forward, um, at least a couple of candidates. If everybody is still interested after the cycle, the last one we did, we had some folks who, who dropped out. Um, so hopefully we'll have enough to move forward after this round. Um, and uh, some of the selectmen I need to still have uh, some additional follow-ups with a couple of um, uh, some of the uh, members who remain uh, with some updates and some additional information uh, based on where things are now. But uh, uh, forward progress, as Selectman Donnelly said, there's uh, uh, some good momentum uh, in that particular area right now. Toby? I'm yeah, Toby, Toby Arsenian, 95 Granite Street. Uh, at your last meeting, I inquired when we would have the public hearing on the projects before the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, I was told, and I thought it was uh, unhelpful and rude, that I could contact the chairman for that information. Uh, the public generally should be interested in that information, and you interested in getting it out. As it so happens, the Community Preservation Committee met this afternoon at 3 o'clock. That's an hour at which working people cannot attend a meeting, uh, which is you know, certainly legal, but equally certain unfair and improper. Uh, at that meeting, they voted to fund the various projects. Uh, if you refer to the bylaws, uh, Chapter 2, Section 5D, 2 Duties, uh, it spells out when they're supposed to hold the public hearing and the purpose of it. And what's there in the bylaws simply does not make sense. It's in terms of uh, planning for projects from town committees. Uh, in fact, the one point at which a public hearing makes sense and would count is after they have reviewed all of the projects, but before they have voted to fund any of them. So today they voted to fund the projects, and according to Laurie Kaiser, who will shortly be on, uh, the Community Preservation Committee is now committed to uh, at least partially honor the bylaws in holding a public hearing. 
but that will be of no use or interest to the public since the decisions have already been made. Uh, I attempted to uh, revise what's in the bylaw to put it um, more in terms of how it actually works and how it should work and was told by the government and bylaw committee that they would uh, be glad to review my revisions. Uh, later they decided that they would not do so. So we're left with a bylaw that uh, doesn't make sense and doesn't work and we're not going to have a public hearing to review the projects at a time when it would be of any use or interest to the public. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Nathaniel? Unmute. Let Monty do it, yeah. All right. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Chairman uh, Brackett. Um, uh, just a brief comment and, and an offer for our town. Um, on the first of this month, I was able uh, to attend the Pride flag raising in Manchester uh, by the sea. It was a, a really nice event. Um, it was a warm and welcoming event for the whole community. I then saw a comparable event take place in our neighboring town of Gloucester or neighboring city of Gloucester. Um, I'm happy, I see that nothing of the sort has happened in Rockport yet and with Pride Month uh, just 10 days left. Um, I wrote the other week to um, Mr. Vieira and offered to purchase uh, a flag for our town so that we too could participate in this uh, month's celebration. Um, I put that offer out on the table. It would be nice if Rockport could get this done before the end of the month. And um, having not received an, a reply from Mitch on this specific subject, although I know he's very, very busy, I thought I'd bring it up to the select board. So um, it could be, we could be also participating in what all our other uh, communities seem to have done as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nathaniel. I will say that at the first, or what, two meetings ago, I believe that the selectmen voted what was the vote, Mitch? I wasn't here, so. The, um, it, it came up relating uh, particularly, I believe, to a flag um, uh, for Juneteenth and the board had opted that uh, because we only have one flagpole at town hall um, uh, that is planning to revise its policy rel relating to that. Um, and that it had, uh, I believe, encouraged folks to, you know, that people would do it individually, but that, um, the town was not able to, to, we only have one flagpole out front and the board did not uh, opt to do that. Um, if I'm remembering that correctly. Right. And Mr. In, in Gloucester so, also put it on the single flagpole. It's so just, Denise, I think you probably have some additional. Yeah. Um, and the, the other reason that we um, chose not to, um, although all of us support Juneteenth, um, obviously support- it's, um, not, it's not a Juneteenth may issue. I, may, I finish, may I finish? Um, the original vote that Ross is referring to was from Juneteenth. Um, and at that meeting, we chose, we voted not to um, move forward with raising that flag because of the recent Supreme Court decision that affected Boston, where if you allow one group um, to um, raise a flag specific to an issue, you have to allow every group to do it. And we chose not to go down that path. Selectman Donnelly, if you could just clarify, you referred to Juneteenth. My offer was for a pride flag. Yes, Nathaniel, as the offer is the same, we still stand by one flag on the poll. That was the purpose of the vote to stand with the American flag that gets on the poll. And, you know, because if one flag goes up, if another group would like their flag raised up, we would honor that in due to the Supreme Court ruling. That's basically it. And I would like to say, I think. The American flag is represents everyone of America. So I think that flag is just as good as any other flag. I, 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 I know some people disagree, but I just think it it represents all of America and all Americans that in, are in this country. So but I understand where you're coming from. But as Stuckman Stuckman Donnelly said, we're all equally to raise our own flag as we would like. Yeah, Selectman Brackett, I'll, I'll close with one additional offer and a, and a thought. Um, for the thought, 
Yes, the American flag does technically represent all of us, but the reason that the Prague Pride was considered necessary is because for far too long, members of our communities have not been included. And this is to say that they are included and it is to be considered important that we address the wrongs of our past. And so the American flag has stood for a lot of things and it's important that we as a community can stand for a more evolved view in the world. In terms of an additional offer, I do have a very nice portrait, um, which I'm happy to loan to the town of Rockport for the remainder of Pride Month, which could be hung in Town Hall, um, which is um, uh, a portrait of Marsha Johnson that was painted by a quite famous artist. I think um, that would be a discreet way. It's not an issue that has to deal with uh, the flagpole. It is not an affront to the American flag, and it is a beautiful piece of artwork that therefore could be appreciated for the remaining nine days of this month of Pride Month. So that way, Rockport too has taken a stand to say that we are an inclusive community. Thank you. Laura? Uh, my name is Laura Evans. I'm from seven. And I was uh, distressed to read in the Gloucester Daily Times this week about um, the seeding of um, part of the public property along the Atlantic path to uh, private landowners. Uh, and because that that's such a magnificent path. I don't understand how that is in the public interest and in the article, and maybe the article was not accurate. So I'd just like to understand from the select people why that move was taken and why that's in the public interest. I, I went over there today to just see what the path is like. And boy, um, it's really different than it was in the 80s and 90s, where it was well marked and people of all ages could walk along it. It's, it's really, really dangerous um, to try to scamper down on, on those rocks. And it's, a, I think it's a loss for the town to sacrifice the public land to private interest. And I'm concerned also that um, it was within the last year that the select people also granted a private person the right to build a walkway over our public uh, wetlands by Cape Hedge Beach. And I'm just I'm wondering if uh, the select people could kind of briefly explain what the, how this is in our best interest to be giving our public lands over to private interests. Thank you. Uh, I'll comment on that if you want to, Mitch, go ahead. Oh, just relating to the Atlantic Path item, it's, it is not public land. So that particular property, we had no deeded right uh, as a town for access. And it was presented to the town that um, there was an issue with the location it was in. And it came down to the town uh, for, for the town's consideration for the selectmen and, and the rights of way in their executive sessions that um, the path either be moved or that property would be closed. So it was keep the path open um, or lose, in, in essence, lose access to that parcel. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll defer to the selectmen on rationale behind that, but I just want to clarify that there was not public land given away in that, in that circumstance. Um, again, the rationale I'll defer to the selectmen. I just, I just would like to underscore, um, I know you repeated it, Mitch, but it's very important that people understand that this was not public land. It was never public land. Um, and so nobody ceded public land to a private individual. Rather, the private individual granted um, land to the town for the Atlantic path to be able to continue. I realize there's a history and a tradition there, but it's important that people understand the difference. Thank you, Stephanie. I, I wonder if, if I may, um, the, the papers of Harry Whalen, um, who was the town poet. And he also, he wrote a chapter in a book um, that we published back in 1985, Alluring Rockport. And he had a, a lot of papers. And what the last chapter is about walkways to the sea. And I will email you guys a copy of that because he does document that from the Emerson Inn all the way up to Andrews Point. And he's got maps in there showing that we Rockporters have public access to that land. So whoever has his papers 
should have documentation for our, you know, our public access to that Atlantic path. But I'll, I don't want to take up your, your meeting here, but I'll email you that chapter because it's and got a lot of good info in it. And I believe Harry Whalen's papers belong to the town and they sh should be in our archives. All right. Thank you. I'll close with it. It's still open to the public. So that's that's one of the benefits of the gift from the McMillan. So Laura Kozicek. Hi, thank you for taking public comment. Um, I would just say about the, the, the location of the, that path. Um, do you actually know where it is? Because um, it's not accessible at high tide events or um, in frozen situations. So we're talking about difference between what was a footpath and what is now clamoring on rock when you then come to chasms that have to be scrambled down and back up. It's not suitable for everybody, but I'm here to ask, um, and also I'm very much in support of Rockport showing significantly its um, quest for diversity and inclusion. I think that is absolutely paramount for our community and we need to find a, an effective way to do that. But I'm here as a conservation commission member who is asking um, for some feedback um, because there has been a great wall of silence. I'm glad for the progress, but I'm not glad about the silence about um, two, two conservation members, uh, commission members. Um, we are a regulatory body and uh, we have to meet and we have not met now for more than two months. Um, other commi commissions who are lacking an agent are meeting elsewhere and including those who are down in their membership. Um, so I would like to know, and I need to know, um, what has actually been done on existing hearings that have that were open, um, new applications, violations and enforcements? Um, is there something in place that is uh, preventing applications from coming in? Because there are 21 day uh, requirements on all of these things. If a, a hearing has been opened, then there has to be an order of conditions um, that is uh, filed and sent within uh, that period of time after it's been closed. If an application comes in, a hearing must be open within 21 days. Um, these are these are non-negotiable uh, items. So I'm just wondering if there's been any way to um, uh, preempt uh, the uh, dissolution of uh, town rule that we have, home rule, uh, with our bylaw and regulations uh, for wetlands protection. And this is a really big deal. And um, I, I think that there need to be some um, some ideas uh, given here as to what your plan is and how you're going to uh, ensure that the commission is meeting as soon as possible. We had two very capable members two months ago, uh, potential members two months ago who were ready to step in and that process didn't take place. So I need to know who is it that is looking after and protecting the town's interests, ensuring that wetland violations are not happening they are, and managing notifications about those violations and enforcement. Um, so there are you know, a number of things. There were people that could have stepped back on to the commission. We need, we're told we need four. The state definition of a quorum is, and I quote, a majority of those in office at that time. Um, I've asked people on, on the, uh, a town hall, I've asked people, um, in government and bylaws, where is it that says um, something different than, than that? I know we are a seven member uh, body, but um, obviously the state has protocols for helping in these situations. Laura, um, I, I just, if I may, Ross, um, uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanna take issue with the great wall of silence. You reached out to me with questions and I answered your questions. And the reason you know that the town is saying that we need four members to meet 
is because I answered your question. So I, I just want to take it, issue with that characterization. Also, if you had other questions, you could um, have reached out to me again. I'm about to send a spreadsheet to you, Alan and um, Ashley, the remaining CONCOM members. I've spent time in the office going through um, the mail and the different filings and have put together a spreadsheet showing the outstanding issues. And I will be asking each of you individually to weigh in on um, what you think the status of those is. So I just wanted to make that point. Mitch, do you wanna to speak to the, um, the quorum question? I'm not prepared to uh, answer that at this moment. Uh, I was looking Donnelly. So, so once again, it, um, I appreciate that all, Denise, very much um, uh, for uh, your getting back to me on that. But it didn't actually uh, show me where in in uh, Rockport bylaws uh, it it does say that specifically. So I just I haven't I haven't seen that, um, and it is highly irregular that a commission lapse in this way. So I, 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 I've talked to numerous people in other uh, communities, and this is a real standout. It's very unusual. All right. Um, Thank you, Laura. We're, we're working with the state. We're following their, their guidance. And uh, it's on my understanding that we're trying to get a meeting set up with you as well, and we can discuss some of those questions once, once we get that meeting set. So thank you for the feedback. All righty. Any more public comment? All right, we'll move on to board, commission, and committee updates, and we'll be going to Lori with the governance bylaw, government and bylaw. I'm Lori Kaiser. I am the. Uh, I have been unmuted. Okay, good. <laughs> I am uh, uh, the chair of the government bylaw committee, and I have sent you a memo, which I hope everybody read that you're supposed to have gotten in your packet, which is going to give an outline of my. Um, of our present, how we are, the government bylaw committee is planning to present this code of bylaws to the town meeting, this fall town meeting. And we met on June 16th with uh, myself, uh, our vice chair, and uh, the town administrator, Mitch, and our moderator. And because all of us had a, mute, a concern that we have an awful lot of material that we're going to be trying to go forward with. And we wanted to make sure that how we could handle it so that town meeting didn't get bogged down. So my memo addresses that. And the real highlights of it, which is what I have to report, is that first of all, we're not going to try to take the entire bylaws. We are going to take about half of them, um, maybe a little over half. And I would also say that what we're for the majority of what we're taking is so much of this is really pretty standard things. It's a lot of updates of typos. And, uh, and, if, and if you look at through Articles A through B, I've broken them down to a, a way to, let me back step, how to present this to town meeting instead of, is to say, we, there's a lot of general information, I mean, general things that affect almost every line of the bylaws. So there's no reason to go through it line by line. We can just have some general votes that says that I'm hoping is one such things as starting Article A. Uh, allow us to change the terms from the Board of Selectmen to uh, and select men to a select board. That was a recommendation by town council. Uh, so if we could do these general votes, then it by the time we finish up with these general votes, the other one was such things as changing the town of Rockport to a reference of town. Again, something town council has asked us to do throughout, suggested throughout the, the code. There are, you know, these are all very, easy things. Um, then sometimes we write numbers. We say, you know, 150 votes for quorum. And then we put, we write it, we don't put the new, the, uh, the number there. We just write 150 votes. So we've, you know, it's simple things of adding 150 votes in parentheses, or there's places where they write it out 150 and they don't write it out, you know, in text. So we're, that would be, that takes care of an amazing amount of corrections which is, is odd, but that's those are the things we're talking about. Um, the other thing that we're uh, talking about is the citations, how Massachusetts general laws is cited throughout this is all over the board. So we're asking, we would ask the town meeting to just allow us to do a standard um, thing, which is M Massachusetts general laws, MGL. 
uh, let's see, then the other thing would be to, you know, if you, I, I guess there's only a few more, so I'll go through them for the audience who's there, which is also, uh, we have such things that if how we cite to changes that we've made over the years, we've had amended, added, changed. We just want a uniform way of doing it, saying amended, and then the abbreviation like fall town meeting would be FTM and you'd put the date and it would be at the paragraph. And we just asked town meeting to give us blanket permission to fix all those. Uh, the next one would be, uh, we are, it was an issue to deal with pronouns. And this is a thing with all towns are dealing with right now, apparently it's the he, she, they, their issue. Uh, we have looked at it and said, all we really need to do in our bylaws is to change, just repeat the noun. So if you're saying, the DPW director um, does so and so. You instead of saying his or her powers, you'd say the DPW's powers. And so we've just asked them to give us blanket permission to change, put in the relevant noun in things, and that gets rid of the whole issue of his, her, they, there. And also, it's really actually very clarifying when you read it because then it becomes much easier to read because you know exactly what person you're talking about, which is great. Um, and then the final thing to ask the most federal, state and federal citations uh, to be able to just update those and to update the, uh, the names of agencies because these change over time. And so a lot of the changes we have in this or several of them are just changing those types of things. So if they would just give us blanket permission to do that. Yeah, and then the final one is to say, can we just change all the mistakes of grammar, capitalization, punctuation and typos and there are a lot of them throughout the bylaws over years, you know, at least 15 years of things being added and just it not being proofed. So if we do that, we take out about two thirds of the bulk of what we need to do. And if we can vote those as general votes, then the next process will be go through, uh, I su I'm suggesting that we take, uh, make articles out of each of the chapters. And we're not, of just the chapters we're gonna go forward with, and then we would do, you'd put the chapter up, like chapter one, and then we would not deal with all those, you wouldn't have to go to the lines that have all the things that the general votes have. All we'd be dealing with is any, any change that's different than those five. And we will work with Bob Bisnick to get a cheat sheet. So as he's going through, he's gonna know, you know that if town is granted, you know, all of them or one of them or two of them that he can just, it'll just be, he can just go through it and put a hold on it on you. So chapter one, he'll go, read only those sections that we still need to be changed in that chapter one. And he would say, hold. And I mean, he would call out the section and people would say, like we do with the budget, say, hold. And then we would go through the rest of the chapter, just, cha just one chapter per article. And then we will go back and deal with those holds. And if there aren't any holds, and in most cases, I don't think there will be, a lot of this is really very simple. You read the language, it's pretty clear. We'll give explanations ahead of time of why you wanna do it. So that's that's the bulk of it. So um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions based on that. How many chapters is that gonna be? Just well, like it's gonna be chapters. I've It'll be 12 chapters um, of this time, but you know, a lot of them, once we take out two thirds of the work is done if you do the general by, general stuff. So you're not going through this line by line. You're gonna end up with, let's say like a chapter one, you have a definite, you would have it, what it, you had about you know, different parts of it. You get down to about two, two questions in it and they're pretty simple in each chapter. So it should go very quickly. And the other part about it is if we get, you gotta get to these, changes eventually. So we can, at least if we do it chapter by chapter in different articles, if we get bogged down or we get exhausted or it goes for too long, we just cut the meeting off and then we just finish up that chapter and then all the chapters move over to the next one. They are not interdependent. So they're discrete pieces and you can just keep going. And um, you know, sadly, we got to get through it at some point. So I don't know if, you know, uh, the other option is a special meetings. So. And for like the uh, pronouns and select the select board, is that like one vote or is each? What? Nope, one vote. Be one? Okay. We're going to do one vote. So if you look in the, the memorandum, I have articles A through, it's like eight different articles. And we could combine some of these, but I think it's easy. It's going to be fast. If you just say, okay, town meeting, 
change, what we're asking you to do is give us permission through the entire bylaws that we are gonna be reviewing under the 2000, you know, under this entire process is, you know, say, change these terms to select board. The town will vote it up or down. If they vote it down, we just keep moving. And, and it doesn't matter that issue is resolved for the entire bylaws, we just won't be changing it. Or we will be changing it depending on what the town meeting wants to do. In almost every one of the issues, the only issue that becomes a little bit of, uh, you'd have to, you, these are all, you know, you either vote it up or you get voted down, we're not gonna do it, or we are gonna do it. And if we don't, the only one is if we're asking for typos and those things that if they say, no, we're not gonna give you blanket permission to change those things. Then when we get to those chapters, we're gonna have to look at the typos and the punctuation. And that I just don't think town meeting is gonna make us do that, but that's up to them. But so if they don't do it, you end up with very little, you know, it'll go quickly after that. There's very few items here, but when you look at it and when you break it down to articles, it's gonna look like a lot, but I don't know have any other way because that ultimately we have to get through all of this. So whether you, we start it and we do an evenings meeting and say, we'll find out how it goes. And at that point we can make, I guess you make a decision whether we go to a special meeting or whether we go to a, a continuation um, is, um when you uh, do that <laughs> mitch have, have you asked bob what he's i know he's gonna chime in later on but have you asked him now he was in on the said? discussion uh that okay. Lori referenced okay yeah i mean i'm i'm honestly not against getting as much done as possible but i don't know how the other members feel and how the town's going to feel based on yeah, last meeting we had when well, we had to change definitions yeah well this is a very different a, a, not only approach, but just these bylaws break down into distinct chapters. Yeah. So you're going to do chapter one, you know, where we got bogged down is that you had huge amounts of things to look at and you had, they cross -re cross -re were referencing each other. So mm -hmm. if you didn't do one, you know, we got bogged down in that. And that's just not going to be the issue here. There aren't any cross, -re cross references. It's one chapter each, you know, and if, and again, if they don't give us the blanket stuff and that's the stuff that goes throughout, then, then we do it chapter by chapter. All right. Any other questions from? No, it, it sounds um, it sounds logical. Um, that's all I'll say. So therefore, <laughs> that's right. I'll go along with it. Thank you for doing that um, to you and the committee, Lori. Very grateful for what you're doing. Long overdue. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see when we get through town meeting whether we're grateful or not. <laughs> yeah, I think. Looks good to me. I, okay. and you guys can get going on it and see we'll how far proceed. You get it. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. And thank you. All right. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda. If there's yes. any items you'd like to be held, let me know. If not, I'll take a motion. Okay. I move that the board approve all non held items on the consent agenda. Second. All right. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Selectman Lilia? Aye. Selectwoman Donnelly? Aye. And Selectman Brackett votes aye. Motion carries. All right, now onto the action list. Consider the appointment to Board of Registrars. Registrars. Mr. Chair, we have um, Town Clerk Melanie Waddell with us. And, and if it's uh, all right with the board, um, she'll address items one and two. So the board will be actually only acting on item number one this mm -hmm. evening, but she'll give some context and some discussion associated with uh, item number two for your consideration. And she has recommendations that have been prepared for you. Okay. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I just wanted to give a quick update from the town clerk's office. Um, the transition has gone smoothly. Um, we just uh, appointed a new assistant town clerk at the beginning of the month, Courtney Buchanan. So if you haven't met her, please feel free to stop by and say hello. Um, I'm really happy to have her there to have the support. Um, we got the bylaws submitted from the special town meeting uh, to the attorney general. We've been given the date of uh, September 16th to have that determination in by. So hopefully we'll get it sooner. So we know how that outcome is. Um, street listings are available. And we're still following up with the rest of census and we'll be mailing out uh, uh, active inactive voter cards soon. So uh, we have a busy fall ahead. We're gearing up for the September 6th primary state primary, and then there'll be a November 8th election. 
So um, in anticipation of that, uh, we are considering election workers, which I think that will be uh, decided on by the Board of Selectmen in July. Um, we are planning uh, an election worker training, which will happen in August. Um, we'll be bringing in hopefully uh, somebody, a representative from LHS, which help runs the voting machines to answer any questions that people have um, and an election specialist to assist with that. Um, yeah, so um, I've given recommendations over to the Board of Selectmen um, for registrars and election workers. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to a busy fall, so. Thank you. Thank any you. questions for the newly uh, elected town clerk? Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could just um, give your overview and explain your recommendation for the registrars. Sure, um, so uh, we wanted to reappoint the two existing, uh, the registrars are supposed to be done um, in a reappointment every year. So we've asked for a, a reappointment of Maureen Dwinnell, a reappointment of Georgia Gibbons, and there was a vacancy. Um, and we were given uh, suggestions, uh, three each from both the Democratic uh, Town Committee and the Republican Town Committee. Um, and after considering all of them, I, I had given a recommendation, so. And that was up to the board to determine. So, thank you. Welcome. Any questions for Tom Clerk? No. All right, move on to a vote or a motion, I should say. Yes, I move that the Board of Selectmen appoint the following members of the Board of Registrars as recommended by the Town Clerk Maureen Dwinnell, one year term, Georgia Gibbons, two year term, Shirley Conway, three year term. And do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? Roll call vote. Selectman Lilia? Aye. Selectman Donnelly? Aye. And Selectman Brackett votes aye. Motion carries. And you said, what did you say about number two, Mitch? Uh, the, uh, there will not be action on that item this evening. The clerk just provided uh, basically the full list of names that she's gotten for all the precincts. Uh, for the board to start to consider and, and, and be aware of um, that one will come back to you um, as an action item again in mid July. Uh, is, that, is that correct, Madam Clerk? Mid, mid July? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Have yes. a great night. Next, we have an abatement of age outstanding receivables. <clears throat> yes, I move that the selectmen abate a commitment for Larry Nash of 19A Granite Street, Rockport, Mass, in the amount of $1,348.08 for the fiscal year 2011 Granite Pier winter and summer storage and moving charge. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Any discussion? Yeah, so can, can somebody translate for me? Sure. So this is. Um... Uh, been deemed uh, uncollectible by the treasurer's office uh, mm -hmm. over a decade of attempts. Yeah. Um, and it's time to clear the deck on that one as we, as we did with um, uh, previous receivables. Thank you. All right. Roll call vote. Select Manolia. Aye. Select Woman Donnelly. Aye. And select my bracket votes. Aye. Motion carries. Next on our list is farmer's winery license to sell at the Rockport farmer's market. Do we have anyone from the Farmer's Market to speak on this, Mitch? I know they sent a letter, but I wasn't sure if anyone was coming. Uh, no, I don't believe anybody's here for it, Mr. Chair. It is, um, I believe it's been at least two years with this same uh, winery same in front of the board. Yes. All right. Do I have a motion? Yes, I have a motion. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve and sign a Farmer's Market wine license for Westport Rivers Vineyards and winery to sell bottles of their wine at the Rockwood Farmers Market from June 25, 2022 to October 15, 2022. Second. And I just want to, they will be doing tastings as well. I just wanted to make sure that's clear. Should that be included in the motion, Mitch, or is that kind of? I, I believe uh, as long as the license is fine as is. Yep. All right, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Roll call vote. Second, Lilia. Aye. Select woman Donnelly. Aye. And select woman bracket votes aye. Motion carries. Next up, where am I? Annual reappointment and policy exemption requests. I believe we have Monica and Mike, right? Um, 
Mr. Chair, yes, in, in your packets, you have um, requests for exemptions to your board's committee's commission's mm -hmm. policy from two individuals, Monica Lawton and Tom Mikas, uh, for your consideration. We'll have Monica speak first if she'd like. Oh, <clears throat> okay. I, I'm happy to say I wasn't, I didn't realize that you would like me to speak. I did. They they I, do have all of the, the the detailed. If you want to just give a okay. quick rundown, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm I'm a member of uh, five committees, uh, which may be crazy, but I am, and I uh, put a lot of time and effort into all of them, and I uh, requested an exemption um, from uh, uh, the three committee limit. Uh, giving reasons on each of them. I'm a member of three related building committees, the DPW Building Committee, the Building Study Committee, and the Firehouse, the uh, Designer Selection Committee for the Firehouse. And uh, frankly, the DPW Committee is one that I've been invested in for several years, would like to see that project to completion. Uh, the Building Study Committee, um, we pretty much finished our, our work, but have yet to um, uh, present it to the selectmen and hope we'll have the opportunity soon. And the firehouse committee is in the thick of, of things right now, trying to move the uh, project forward. I'm also a member of the rights of way committee and um, uh, invest an enormous amount of time uh, in, in that committee um, it, it, on many aspects of the committee. And um, I think it, uh, it, uh, it, it would be difficult to cover a lot of that uh, if I were to step down and I'd be, I would step down, but I don't think it would be in the best interest of the town, quite frankly. And likewise, the town art committee, um, uh, this is a very small committee and, and uh, I provide a lot of technical expertise to the committee. Um, and I think it's uh, beneficial um, uh, for me to remain and I would be happy to remain. Um, I, I do think that this, this policy, in my humble opinion, uh, should be revisited. I, I think if there's a need to restrict the number of committees that people are involved in, you do that going forward prospectively and uh, not uh, allow people to join uh, more than three. But once you're involved, unless you're not doing the job, I think there's good reason to uh, allow uh, someone to continue just as we don't have term limits. Um, I, I personally don't see the basis for restricting unless uh, someone is not doing the job, basically. I think I'm doing the job and I think uh, I'd like to continue if you'd like to let me. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. And then Tom Mikas, if you wanna to touch on yours. I guess I'm a slacker because I only belong to four committees, not five like Monica. But uh, one of them is an elected position. One of them is appointed by the moderator. There's really only two that are appointed by the Board of Selectmen. And I might note that three of my four committee positions are under number and my leaving would put them further under the number. Uh, and if the rationale as I understood it at the original vote on this policy was to make room for others uh, there's no others that are that are coming in, especially uh, the one where there currently is no a vacancy is uh, rights away. And I've conferred with uh, the chairman, Nathan Ives. He said there's nobody that wants to join. And moreover, my term on that committee does not expire this year. So I, I see no reason to, to take uh, any action to, to remove one of these positions at this time. All right. Uh Selectman want to discuss? Well, one comment I'll make, and I want to thank both Tom and Monica for all of their service to the town. I think we're very lucky to have such talented volunteers. Um, so thank both of you. Thank you. And um, I guess the one comment I would make, Monica, is that you're 
three, two or three of your committees are time delimited. So yeah. the study committee will presumably dissolve. I assume the firehouse trust committee will at some point dissolve. Um, I, I'm losing track of your other <laughs> The DPW facility committee. They, yeah. they are all, all limited duration. Right, so it's, it's not, I mean, it's not that it's not a lot of work, it's a lot of work, but they will eventually no longer exist because you'll be done, presumably, mm -hmm. and probably move on to other things to add to your list. Um, so I just wanted to make that one, one point. And I'll say the original rationale wasn't to open up space, but it was to encourage space by having some members have a less monopoly on some of the committees that discourage <laughs> some members of the public to participate. And, and I'll say to Monica's, two of your committees, as Stuck Woman Donnelly's pointed out, is time limited, but it's also you were asked to be on that committee for those periods. And I'm sure you volunteered as well, but it was a, more of a committee that reached out to you to be on them because of your expertise. Um, that is Stuck true. Woman, Stuck Woman, Leia? Uh, and it is an effort prospectively to uh, certainly limit the number of committees that anyone is on. And in so doing, we felt it was necessary for those that were on more than three committees to in fact step down from those committees. You may consider it um, inappropriate in one sense of the word, but from our point of view, it was a matter of trying to make sure that everyone who might be interested in those committees um, could look at that and point our decision as being fair handed so um, that really sort of sums up our position that the limit of three committees makes sense to us. Um, if there were no limit, um, then theoretically there could be four or five or more. Um, so therefore at this particular point in time, we wanted to constrain the number of committees that any one of you are on. We do appreciate your efforts, appreciate the efforts of everybody who serves on committees. Um, so, uh, I think that sort of sums it up. Now, would we guys want to do a motion on these, or do you want well, to wait for the other two uh, selectmen to be present when we do a full vote for this, as it is a selectman's policy? Yeah, I'd rather wait um, for Sarah and Paul to be here, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's not a problem. I, I had the same thing in, in mind, just yeah. as it's a selectman's policy, we have all the all members to vote. so. I won't ask you to to present again or, or talk at the next meeting, but we will take our formal vote on the exemptions. I would agree. So thank you, Monica and Tom. Until next time. <laughs> okay. But we will move on to the reappointments. We have a motion for the reappointments. Yes, I move that the board make the following one year appointments all subject to compliance with the board's policy on board committee Commission membership, beautification committee, Stephanie Wolf, Christine Lovegren, Mary Ann Kiley, Martha Finta, Mary Mins, Terry Duffy, Beth Renner, Jackie Welsh, Carrie O'Donnell, Amy Oaks, Economic Development Committee, Jonathan Gove, Town Art Committee, Karen Berger, Brian McMullen, Rosemary Pillarella, Dorothy Marshall. Um, second. For discussion, if you'd like to add Monica um, pending the vote on the ex exemption, you can get that out of the way now. If you'd like, sure, Monica Lawton pending the vote on the exemption. Do I have a second on that? Second, Leia? Yes, I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All right, roll call vote. Selectman Leia? Aye. Selectwoman Donnelly? Aye. And selectman bracket votes aye, motion carries. Yeah. All right, next up we have beach use permit for August 19th, 2022. As you saw in your packet, and is there anyone here to speak on that? Mr. Tree, yes, the applicant uh, is here, uh, Joanna Evans. Hey, Joanna. Do you want to tell us hi. a little bit about your event? Yeah, so um, I'm very happily getting married at Hammond Castle on August 20th. And a lot of folks are coming in the night before because many of the uh, hotels have a two night minimum. 
So wanted to have just kind of an informal gathering for everyone who's able to, to make it in on Friday night. And I didn't want to assume that, you know, I could just tell people like, hey, anyone who's in town show up at this beach. So I wanted to go through the proper channels and, and get a permit. Right now, I've only got about 60 people total RSVP'd for the wedding. So I'm only expecting there to be maybe 30 people at one time. But I didn't want to take the chance that they, you know, all 60 of them show up at once and we should have gotten a permit. So so it's planning just an informal gathering for folks to say hi. You know, we, we might have some games, um, possibly just charades or bridge. My family, we all play bridge in my family. Um, maybe we'll have a cornhole set if that's something that you guys are okay with. But um, nothing rowdy, just, a, you know, a place for people to gather. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. I just want to make sure you do know that it will still remain open to the public just so we're clear yep. on that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. Any other questions from the selectmen? No? All right. Well, I think we'll you, move I, on. I, I, quick question that comes yeah. to my mind. Are you considering a, a one-day alcohol license or will there be no alcohol? They're not no eligible alcohol. for one. Um, not I'm alcohol. encouraging folks to get ice cream cones in town and then walk down to the beach. Fine. Okay. Good to know. Nice. Sounds good. I think we'll move on to a motion. Okay. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve the request of a beach use permit for Joanna Evans for use of Front Beach on August 19th, 2022 from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. for a family gathering of approximately 50 people subject to beach the beach remaining open to the public. All right, do I have a second? Stuckman Donnelly's muted, Monty. I didn't do. Second. Second. All righty. Any more? Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Selectman Lilia? Aye. Selectman Donnelly? Aye. And Selectman Brackett votes aye. Motion carries. Have fun, Joanna. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. That next item up is year end transfers, and I'll leave it to Mitch to explain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So there are three in front of you this evening, all related to the library. Um, first one is $600 from a, a wages account to the buildings and grounds account, $1,000 again from a wages account to the library materials junior account, and $1,000 uh, from another library um, part-time uh, uh, wages account to library materials adult. Um, you know, the library, like all of our departments, is, uh, is certainly feeling the pinch financially with everything and with the uh, expenses that had to, had to have been put out for COVID. Um, you know, it certainly has uh, uh, taxed uh, the budget. So this has become, as you're well aware from all of your meetings, pretty commonplace to be making these transfers from um, labor to expense to uh, get things balanced out and uh, taken care of at, at this point. So uh, straightforward, um, I've signed off on it on my end. Uh, should you approve this evening, it'll move to the finance committee uh, next week, but again, um, uh, straightforward uh, request uh, for your consideration this evening. Thank you. Take a motion on the. Oh, um, yeah, I was just looking at Cindy. Cindy, uh, did you want to say something? Nice to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you all as well. Um, just that we, like many departments, have had um, substantial. Um, COVID expenses that um, have not been reimbursed um, because of delays and FEMA and all of that. So uh, we're feeling a pinch. So this is a requirement just to pay the end of year bills that have been expended. Okay. Um, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve and ask the chairperson to sign the following year end transfers. Um, $600 from Library Administration Assistant Wages to Buildings and Grounds, $1,000 from Library Administration Assistant Wages to Library Materials Junior, $1,000 from Library Labor Less Than 20 Hours Wages to Library Materials Adult. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Roll call vote. Select the Aye. Select the woman Donnelly. Aye. And Selectman Brackett votes aye, motion carries. Next on our list is local opera funding, which all fund requests, there is none. 
So we can move past that and we'll move on to the Harbor Master Alert One Vessel Declaration of sur Surplus Property. Okay, Take I a motion. I move that the Board of Selectmen declare the Harbor Master's Alert One Vessel as surplus town property and authorize it to be placed at, at online auction. Second. Mitch, do you want to touch on that just to? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, we're very fortunate that the new uh, Harbor Master vessel uh, that was approved uh, at town meeting uh, is here. It arrived last week. It is absolutely a beautiful vessel. Um, so alert one uh, that you are considering for declaration this evening is a 1984 Boston Whaler. Um, and uh, it has ably served the town uh, since then. So uh, the request is to put that out um, for an online auction. Uh, you know, we, there's a site that we use, and, and again, through the appropriate advertising. Um, we expect that we will get a pretty big uh, showing for, for this boat. There are a lot of folks who have expressed interest. Uh, so it requires the selectmen um, uh, declaring it for surplus. Uh, we would put it out for auction, and then it would come back to the board for final award, uh, subject to the uh, highest and, and responsive bidder uh, for this uh, 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 surplus um, declaration. So. Uh, the new one again is in, and uh, this one is uh, no longer needed at this time. It's great news for them. I I, wow. I got to see pictures of it, but it looks wonderful. So, how 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 long have, how many times have they been out on it so far? Every I think it day just or? went in, just went in the water yesterday. I believe. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> but it it looks you know when you when you see it, it looks very different from the old alert. No problems uh, floating. No issues at all. Okay. Awesome. All right, roll call vote. Selectman Lilia. Aye. Select woman Donnelly. Aye. And select woman bracket votes aye. Motion carries. Next up, we have town administrator report. And he'll open us up with the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first item is the uh, review of the FY21 uh, audit. Uh, with us this evening, we have uh, Jim Powers, who's the partner in charge of our account with Powers and Sullivan, our audit firm, uh, and Ben uh, Adsit, who is also with Powers and Sullivan. Um, Jim uh, is here and prepared to give a general overview. The board has the audit materials, um, and he is here to, to give a, an overview and to uh, discuss any uh, questions that you may have. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. Um, as Mitch said, we are, uh, we're the auditors of the, the town, and uh, every year you're required um, by the state and also federal uh, granting agencies to have a full-blown what's called a single audit. Uh, we've conducted that in the past. One of the things I'd like to start off with is, uh, again, I'm the partner in, in charge from Powers and Sullivan, and with me is, is Ben Adsit, and he's the uh, person that really does most of the work out there in the field. Uh, we actually have a team out there uh, today uh, going over um, the fiscal year 22 audit, doing the preliminary work, so we'll be in good shape as we go through. Um, I'd like to thank Mitch and his, his team for all the assistance that they've given and actually the attention to uh, detail and following up on issues that we may find during the audit. Uh, also for the superintendent and his team over at the school for uh, giving us everything we need on a timely basis. And uh, it, the, the year went very well from an audit standpoint. Um, we uh, I just uh, just going to go over a, an overview of the three different reports uh, that we issue. Um, the first one that we go over is called the Schedule of Federal Awards. There's a federal requirement that says if any community in the nation um, receives and spends over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in any one fiscal year, they're required to have what's called a single audit, which is a compliance audit um, of the. Um, uh, expenditures of those funds to make sure that they're in compliance with the grant rules uh, that, that you've gone through. Uh, you don't always have one each year. School usually is sitting right about 750,000, may not have it every year. Uh, but last year in fiscal year 21, you had about $780,000 worth of uh, COVID CARES Act spending that puts you at a million six of expenditures for the year. And the balances of that was mainly the school. Um, I'm pleased to announce that the report itself, there were no findings at all relative to that from the school standpoint and from the, uh, the CARES Act funding. Um, and so it was a clean audit opinion on all issues related to that. 
and um, it's it's the best report you can get. And like I said, the school has been doing that. We've been auditing their grants from years, uh, year to year to year, and we really have not had any findings in the past or in fiscal year 2021, and would expect the same as we go forward into fiscal 22. Uh, one of the things you had mentioned, even though you didn't have any requests a couple of uh, items ago in fiscal year 22, uh, the issue that you're going to have from a single audit standpoint is the spending of the APA funds. I believe you got a little over $2 million worth of allocations, uh, 2.1 uh, plus, and um, not exactly sure where you are on that. It's kind of what we're, we're, our team out there is doing today, uh, but we may have to be auditing those particular grants. One of the good things that the feds did in their final rule relative to OPER is that um, you get to spend the money on any governmental service because you receive less than $10 million in OPER funds. So the allowability of this is extremely flexible for the town of Rockport. As you would go through, people that received over $10 million have more compliance requirements. So we would expect um, any of the expenditures that you vote and you go through uh, to be allowable. We'll still have to audit that for compliance, uh, but it gives you a lot of leeway in what you need to do. And the only thing you have to make sure is that it's a governmental service. Uh, and pretty much everything the town does is a governmental service. There's a few specific things that aren't allowable and we're there and Mitch is, uh, knows our numbers. So if there's anything that's questionable, or if he has questions on it, he'll uh, get a hold of me and Ben to make sure that we do any pre audits on that. If you have something that's a request and you're not sure it's allowable, that's what we're here for. Uh, any question on that report? Go okay. Uh, the next report is the management letter. Now, this is a critical document. As we go through, we have to make sure that the town uh, has uh, sound internal controls to protect the assets of the town, has the ability to prepare its financial statements at the end of the year, be in compliance with all the Department of Revenue's regulations as you go through, filling out your Schedule A, et cetera, as you go through. But more importantly, making sure that you reconcile your books, you reconcile your cash, your receivables, et cetera. Um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to report, if you go back over the last several years, there had been uh, several different reports, one of them being significant deficiencies just on internal control documentation. All of those have been resolved in the past. Um, we had an issue uh, that we brought up for this year relative to ambulance, old, old ambulance receipts. And you, you did that a little bit earlier with the abatement of an uncollectible piece. Um, I'm pleased to announce that that point in our follow-up in this year has been already resolved relative to the point that we had written. And so you have no outstanding uh, issues as far as we're concerned that um, puts at risk the, uh, the assets of the town and your ability to account for everything and uh, make the audit easier as you go through. Um, and so if you had any questions on the management letter, I'd address those now. Uh, Mitch, if you wanted to make a comment on that, I know you're, you're on top of that and make sure that we work with you to eliminate those particular findings. Yes, as, uh, as uh, indicated, you know, this was really clearing out those receivables and, and you know, from our end, uh, we had been working on them for a number of years, continuing to try to collect, but there, there is a point where you need to say they are simply uncollectible. Yeah. And um, you know, based on the advice from ours and Sullivan, um, uh, that has been that has been uh, addressed, um, but you know again at that I I viewed that um, and I shared that with the, the finance staff that just trying to get the money to come in on those, um, but we do need to be realistic about the time and effort, uh, so those have been uh, abated. Yes, and one of the one of the things relative to that that's not going to be something that uh, Mitch would have to put on the recap to raise for next year. It's not going to reduce free cash or anything else. It's just not going to. In free increase free cash, but it never was going to because of the age of the receivable and realization that sometimes a business your size when you're, you know, dealing with 30 plus million dollars a year for 10, 12, 30 years, and all of a sudden, 
you know, it's 300, 400 million dollars worth of activity and writing off that smaller amount is, is not an, an issue, at least from our vantage point, from what we see. Uh, it's commonplace for all communities and um, you're probably on the lower end for what we see as write-offs as you go through because you do have pretty good collection procedures in there and leaning the taxes where you can. Um, again, any questions on that? If not, I'll move on to the final report. Nope. Okay, the final report is the report on examination of the basic financial statements. This is basically telling the reader of the financial statements. Uh, you put together your financial statements in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. You maintain your books and records under the uniform municipal accounting system promulgated by the Department of Revenue Bureau of Accounts. And that is what every city and town has to abide by. And that's how you build your books and records and the rules relative to how the collective treasurer works, how the accountant works, how the school has to pre present their activity and what Mitch has to monitor and make sure that everybody's in you know, compliance with all the reporting requirements uh, to the Department of Revenue and also to um, the, um, the state for the school's issues. Um, pleased to say that, again, uh, you have completely uh, um, complied with all the general accepted accounting principles rules, uh, and that's uh, out there for any reader to take a look at your uh, financial condition and the rules as you go through it. It's not Massachusetts rules that this is based on. This is based on um, nationwide rules that uh, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board promulgates uh, the accounting requirements for governments in the, uh, in the nation. So bond rating agencies can take a look at you and compare apples to apples throughout the nation. The Department of Revenue has that, um, their own, uh, like I said earlier, the Uniform Municipal Accounting System. That's your foundational, and that's where you come up and have your free cash certified, uh, both from a, 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 a budgetary UMass basis of accounting and going into GAAP, uh, you, you know, you have an excellent financial condition, uh, at least the way we look at it, that you have, uh, last year you had over $2 million certified for free cash that we're able to use as you go through. You budget conservatively as you go, and, and it's it's been a little bit, tough, especially during the pandemic, with a lot of revenues being reduced due to, uh, you know, meals taxes, hotel, motel taxes, a lot of things like that, that you had to tighten your, your belt to get through that. But still, uh, you had good results this year. Uh, you have still about $3 million in stabilization funds. And for your um, total fund balance in the general fund, again, with some reserves with carryovers, you had about $6 billion as part of that. Your water and sewer funds uh, break even from a budgetary standpoint uh, and, and do a good and, and manage that well. Community pre preservation, you still have $2.3 million inside of that fund. Um, and the biggest issues that you have are the long-term liabilities from both the Essex Regional Retirement System, where you're about, they're about 60% funded for your net pension liability, that they have assets accumulated to cover actuarial uh, valuation in it. And you're scheduled to, in effect, over years, over the next 15 years, um, fully fund that. And hopefully the investment returns over time will relate to that. You'll see some big investment returns from Essex over the last few years. Um, what's happening this year is obviously <laughs> going to have an effect, but it's a long-term perspective on that liability. You didn't accumulate that liability in one year and you're not gonna get rid of it in one year. You still have a 60 year in investment uh, horizon in order to fund all of the um, liabilities related to that. And you had about $20 million worth of a liability re related to that. Um, the bigger liability is the other post-employment um, benefits that's providing health insurance to your retirees as you go through. You only have uh, a, a small amount of money set aside for that, but you are putting money aside, but your net pension, uh, OPEB liability is $45 million. That's a lot, that's a lot more difficult to overcome as you go through. Uh, discount rate is a blended rate of 4.5%. Uh, and 
so that liability, everybody is behind, pretty much everybody. There's a few communities that have actually have funded that, but they were in unique uh, circumstances. Um, and so you're not behind the curve on that, but you're not ahead of it. You're like everybody else out there, pretty much in Massachusetts. There's not a legal requirement to fund OPEB. It's more of what the town wants to do to address that particular long-term liability. Uh, other than those two amounts, everything else looks in really good financial shape. And, and the way you budget uh, conservatively and, and how you've maintained your fund balances, uh, um, I, I just see as excellent. Our audits are only saying whether or not the numbers are accurate. We don't really report on whether they're good or bad. You know, you still have a clean opinion, no modifications. We have communities out there that are in horrible conditions. However, they'll have the same clean audit opinion because they're telling everybody the truth that they're in horrible position. However, you have a nice story that we have an audit that's clean and you're in a lot better position than a lot of your uh, other communities out there. So obviously it's a 75, 80 page report. We're not going to go over that in detail. We did that with Mitch and, um, and the accountant and everybody else that's necessary to do that. But I'm certainly here to address any questions anybody had relative to that. And Ben is also, if there's anything. So is that, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, first of all, I wanna thank um, you and you, and Ben, and then also Mitch and the, uh, the uh, finance team in the town and also the finance committee. It sounds like they've been doing a really um, spectacular job. So that's great news. Um, my question relates to the OPEB liability. Mm -hmm. That's not taken into account in our bond rating. Yes, it is. It is. It is, but it's not. Pretty much everybody in the nation is in the same hole, okay? And in Massachusetts, and so they measure you against everyone else. Uh, you are contributing money to that. And what's going to happen for the most part is that when Essex Regional Retirement System um, is fully funded, and you're legally required to have that done no later than 2040, which is fastly approaching as you go through this. Yeah. Well, the contribution that you make to that liability, because it's the same pop population, what everybody expects to happen is you just won't reduce that appropriation to fund the past service costs. You're mm -hmm. just going to switch that to put that into OPEP. So mm -hmm. it may take you to 2060 to fund this. Mm -hmm. The other thing, select woman, is that Right now, one of the important parameters on there is the discount rate you use to value that liability. And inside the, um, uh, the footnotes, what you'll see is that you're using a 4.5% rate. Now, realistically, everybody, when you're taking a look at retirement systems or people that are funding it, your investment rate of return and your discount rate is usually uh, uh, matches up. You have to use a blended rate because you haven't put enough money in there yet to fully fund uh that if you keep funding it at that rate but realistically you're going to be using a six and a half seven percent rate and that when that goes down that that may take that liability from 45 million dollars down to 30. yep okay and so you by increasing that as time goes on yep. there's a built-in reduction of that particular liability that's mm -hmm. expected again like i said earlier <laughs> Unlike pensions, pensions have been funded for a long time since the Pension Reform Act of 1988, uh, where you used to be on a pay-as-you-go, and then they changed that to an actuarial uh, at the state level. So until the state actually uh, requires the funding to happen by a particular date, it's up to each member community to decide how to fund that particular liability. And, um, and so the, the town has a plan, but it's a long-term plan. It, it, it is. And just to give a little detail to that plan, I know the board's aware, but for the for the public, uh, we have the OPEB Stabilization Trust Fund that's in place um, uh, every year annually inside the operating budget baked into that. We have $125,000 that goes towards it. In the last several years, we've also been contributing an additional hundred, uh, at least $100,000 in free cash as well. So annually, we're putting forward at least one twenty five, dollars but more typically 200 or 225 um, uh, toward that. Again, uh, you know, small uh, small amount towards this this significant uh, factor, but we continue to 
try to be as proactive as possible um, uh, to, to work towards uh, uh, satiating it. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks. Um, Mitch, can you unmute me? You're unmuted. I think right. you're sorry, I had a cough when I when I muted myself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't um, unmute myself. So, uh. um, any uh, any other items to uh, to cover, Jim? Any any anything to flag for the uh, for the board? Any concerns or issues? No, I think we're good. Ben, anything from your standpoint? You you know, I think you, we you get everything you need. Yeah. This year is going as as expected, and um, would like to be able to get the you know, especially with the uh, the pandemic, it's been unusual for the last couple of years to get the audit done because of, uh, especially this year's a little bit, uh, expect a little bit more opened up, but uh, uh, we'd like to get the audit uh, before the select, uh, uh, the board of selectmen, I, I almost said select board, but it hasn't been voted yet. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, a little bit earlier, as depending on your agenda, and we can work with Mitch on that to see um, and if there's anything that was at issue that we found that the board needed to know immediately, we would go through Mitch and make sure that that was addressed at a, uh, as early as possible to make sure that if changes needed to be made. I don't expect anything, um, and I expect this to go smoothly again for the fiscal 22 audit. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? No, I'm not sure. All right. Thank you again, Jim and Ben. All right. Take care. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Next, we'll have the liaison assignments. I don't know if you want to bring it up on the screen, Mitch. Sure, Mr. Chair. One moment. I'll bring those up. Get closed. Let me just pull it back up again. Okay, here we go. So, um, the chair and I, um, as is annually the case, uh, sat down and reviewed the liaison list and uh, have uh, uh, prepared this for your consideration this evening. Let me share the screen. Okay. Can you see the uh, Word doc? Yep. Okay. So these are the... Um, uh, draft uh, list of liaison assignments uh, for your uh, consideration. Uh, some changes from, from last year, some adjustments uh, based on uh, the membership on the board. Um, but uh, you know, I would say many stayed the same. Um, we tried to be sure uh, looking at this that there was a, a reasonable distribution of some of these um, uh, uh, significant committees uh, and the workload that goes along with them. Uh, but um, you know, certainly uh, the board's prerogative on who you wish to liaise with uh, on this list. Um, this is the uh, uh, draft for your consideration. Any questions? No? You have a chance to reflect on this? <laughs> yes, yeah, so this, this is just basically no, 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 no action. No, this is just for no you to... Needed. Okay, to to, to be aware, and um, I, I do know that uh, um, probably your next meeting when, when everybody's present, um, we have flagged a, a bit of a larger discussion on um, uh, uh, calibrating everybody's uh, expectations and understandings as it relates to um, the role of the liaison and um, uh, level of effort. Yes. Good. And of course, this will be sent out to the, well, not each chair will be, of each committee will be informed of their They'll be notified. Liaisons. Correct. Once uh, once the board is on the same page, and again, we'll come back with it next meeting, um, so that uh, the remaining two members uh, can review. Um, and certainly, if there's feedback from the board in between, happy to uh, to do that. It is your um, your list and your prerogative. Thanks. Thanks. There's no questions. I think we're all set. We'll move on. Any questions? No. All righty. We'll move on to last public item and public comment, if any. Anyone that would like, okay, there we go, Toby. Thank you. Um, Toby Arsenian, 95 Granite Street. Uh, I was interested in your discussion of uh, 
waivers for those who serve on multiple committees. And uh, your statement, uh, Ross, that uh, people should have, more people should have the opportunity to serve. Uh, that was something that, that Herman also echoed. Um, I would remind you of uh, what happened when you were reappointing Alan Battistelli to the Board of Appeals. And uh, I asked if the uh, appointment had been advertised as open. Uh, and, you know, Paul Murphy said that such things were advertised. As it turned out, he was incorrect. And I said that uh, once you were appointed, you're basically like a Supreme Court justice appointed for life. Now, you can make a good case either way if somebody has been serving for years and wishes to go on serving the town, uh, that they should have the opportunity to do so. On the other hand, uh, there's not any particular individual. Uh, if you've been there, uh, you know, and nobody else has an, a chance to throw a hat into the ring, uh, it is indeed for life. Um, one other minor point, uh, when you go through the, uh, the list of uncontested items, that's not what they're called, the consent agenda, uh, that was an invention of uh, Don Campbell. And when you decided to adopt that format, uh, the board made the point that you didn't begrudge the time that went into uh, the individual items. Well, I think minimally it, it's proper to list the items, uh, to read them out. Because if you've had a chance to read the agenda beforehand, you know. And if you haven't, you don't know. And you've just approved. And if you're in the audience and haven't an agenda, you don't know what has been approved. Is that a reasonable request? It is. And I'll take it into consideration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Toby. Anyone else for public comment? All righty. We'll be moving to, that's all right. Yep. We'll be moving into executive session. So thank you for attending the public session of the meeting. Would you I'll like? A, uh, yep. I'll take a motion for the executive session. I move that the board enter into executive session for the following. Executive session pursuant to general law, chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Back Beach Neighbors Committee versus the Town of Rockport Land Court CA number 21 MISC 000174. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. Executive session pursuant to general law chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Back, Back Beach Neighbors Committee versus Town of Rockport, Essex Superior Court, docket number 2177CB000364. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. Executive session pursuant to general law, chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Stephen Abel versus Town of Rockport et al., MCAD docket number 22BEM00744. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares, votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. Executive session pursuant to general law chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Sepala versus Town of Rockport et al. Essex Superior Court docket number 2177CV01006 D. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. Executive session pursuant to general law, chapter 30A, section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Glenn McLeod et al. versus Town of Rockport et al., Essex Superior Court, docket number 2177CV00077. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the jurisdiction declares, votes may, may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. 
executive session pursuant to general law chapter 30a section 21a3 to discuss strategy with respect to litigation regarding Rousseau et al versus town of Rockport United States District Court CA number one colon 22-CV-10031 Dash JGD, if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the litigating position of the public body and the chair so declares, votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. Executive session pursuant to General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining, Local 1679, AFSME, General and Supervisors Units. If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and the chair so declares, votes may be taken, will not reconvene in public session. And do I have a second? I'll second that. All right. We are entering into executive session because by not doing so, it will be detrimental to the, to the town's litigating and negotiating positions. The board will not reconvene in open session. Slap in Leah. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Can you say that again? I didn't just didn't hear you. I said aye. Selectman McDonnelly? Aye. And Selectman Brackett votes aye. We are entering into an executive session. At this time, the public portion of the meeting has concluded. We ask that you please exit the meeting at this time.